Hey, Kev, let's let's follow this trail over here. This looks like there might be something waiting down there. All right. Hey, wait a minute. Do you hear that? Yeah, I thought it was just me. What the heck is that? I don't know what that is. Whoa, do you smell that, too? That's unbelievable. Hey, look. What the? Hey, look, those, those branches are moving over there. What the heck is that? Holy cow, is that what I think it is? Look at that thing. It, oh my god. It's a freaking Sasquatch. Welcome to the Bigfoot Terror in the Woods Sightings and Encounters podcast. I'm your host, W.J. Sheehan. Hello, everybody, and thank you once again for joining my brother Kevin and I for what is going to be a great, great podcast. My name is W.J. Sheehan, author of the series Bigfoot Terror in the Woods, Sightings and Encounters, and all of these books, volume one through eight, are available at Amazon in paperback and ebook formats. You can also go to Audible or Amazon or iTunes and get volumes one through six in, uh, or is it seven now? No, volumes one through six in audible format. I'm working on seven, soon, soon, soon. And don't forget about my series, The Exorcists, which is inclusive of Truth and Lies, Diabolica, and Full Moon. Two of those are on Audible at this time, and the rest are also available at Amazon. And right now, I'd like to bring my brother, Kevin, in. Kev, how are you? I'm doing well, Bill. And uh, for your fans out there, uh, you're back in the studio now recording again, right? Yeah, uh, my buddy Bill Herman at Paradiddle Records uh, opened up the studio virtually just for me. He's got no bands or anything over there now. It's just me when he has time. So I'm in the midst of Volume 7. And I'll be back in the studio again in about 10 days. I think his wife is a little freaked out about the whole thing. Uh, They have a a nice studio in the home. And uh, I don't think she's too thrilled about having anybody in the house. Yeah, Uh, but but let's let's be realistic, Bill. She probably wouldn't be thrilled about having you in the house, even if COVID wasn't around. (laughs) (laughs) It's that Bigfoot guy. Oh, no. That Bigfoot Ah. guy is back? (laughs) Does he still have that stuffed Bigfoot in the passenger seat of his car? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Riding in the HOV lane. (laughs) I don't know if you folks know what we're talking about, but here on Long Long Island, <laughs> <laughs> we have an HOV lane. And at certain times of day, if there's at least two people in the car, you can kind of get out of the main flow of traffic and move a little quicker in this HOV lane. And occasionally there's some goofball uh, with a blow-up doll or a, <laughs> a, a dummy uh, dressed up in the passenger seat. Uh, trying to pull off that there's two people in the car. <laughs> hey, it's a high occupancy vehicle. <laughs> he's a little tired. He's not talking much today. <laughs> Be careful. Stay away from him. He's got he's got the COVID. Yeah, yeah. That's it. <laughs> Don't get too but, close to him, officer. <laughs> but what happens is, uh, uh, once in a while on the news, you get a quick photo shot. <laughs> if somebody was around to take a picture of the dummy in the passenger seat. And the and dummy, you and the dummy the in dummy. the driver's seat, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, two dummies. <laughs> uh, Kev, before we get rolling here, I got a little business to take care of. All right. I realized during our last podcast, when we were already in the midst of it, that I didn't bring... Uh, to the microphone, the winner of our last book contest. Ah. So now uh, this is uh, Jonathan P, P like Peter. I don't announce last names. Uh, Jonathan uses part of his email as Green Giant, and he's located in Canada. 
Now, Jonathan, you remember I asked the people to write in and say where they thought the next great Bigfoot footage was going to come from. Mm. And uh, Jonathan had said that he believes it will happen in Finlay Russell, uh, Finlay Russell Provincial Park in Canada. Cool. That's a pretty specific so, location. Yeah, and it's. Uh, uh, I looked uh, a little bit on the map, and uh, it's really uh, a woodsy area. I don't think there's anybody up there, or very few people, if that. But here's the other thing. Now, Jonathan, in his email, said to me, I know, Bill, this contest is only open to people in the U.S. And to that point, I just want to say to everybody listening, wherever you are, if I have one of these little book giveaways, I don't care if you live on a mountain in Thailand. <laughs> if you can get mail, I will get the book to you. So don't think that because Kevin and I are putting this together in the United States that uh, any of you cannot enter one of these little giveaways. Uh, I will get the book to you, and don't worry about it, okay? So how's that, Kevin? That's good. Just don't forget to fill out your customs declaration, Bill, at the post <laughs> office when you send it. Otherwise, they send it back, seriously. It's like... Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, Jonathan, like everybody else, your second part of getting this book is to be listening to this show and respond back to me with your mailing address. So, again, it's Jonathan P., like Peter, uh, uses the email handle of uh, Green Giant, and he's in Canada. So, Jonathan, we hope to hear from you, and I will send that book out to you. And, Bill, isn't there kind of a strict time uh, limit, too? Like, he has to respond within five years, right? <laughs> well, we'll push it. Six years, Six years, Jonathan. okay. Six years. Sorry to be uh, so tough on you, Jonathan. Yeah, yeah, it's hard, but uh, try to pull it We're off. We're all busy, but you got six <laughs> years to respond. <laughs> and in the meantime, if you photograph with a dummy passenger in your car, <laughs> the book deal is off. <laughs> 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 so what do you got today, Kevin? Yeah. Cryptids in the news and other oddities. Yeah, we have a bonus issue. Of cryptids in the news and other oddities today. So we're going to wow. do two items. A short item on vampire bats that was in the news this week. And we're going to go look at some old werewolves in the UK. And specifically, mm. the Flixton werewolf. Ah, the Flixton werewolf. Yeah, you're familiar oh. with the creature. <laughs> Yes, he's a family member. Uh, <laughs> old <laughs> Uncle <laughs> Flixton. <laughs> Remember the monsters every once in a while would have a, sh uh, a, a, a surprise showing of somebody who was in their family, like the creature of the Black Lagoon? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Uncle uh, whatever his name was. <laughs> exactly. So the first thing we're going to talk about is uh, vampire bats, and not the whole origin and stuff, but some of our listeners may have seen this. I don't know if you saw it, Bill. Uh, I think it first showed up on CNN this week where there was a study published by Behavioral Ecology, Ecology this week, and they found that wild vampire bats naturally socially distance themselves from other bats if they're sick. Huh. So I thought that was pretty interesting, you know, where, you know, here we're kind of a lot of us, not all of us, thank goodness, are complaining about wearing masks and stuff like that in this era. And then uh, they end up studying these vampire bats, right, these giant bats, and they find out that these bats actually, when they're feeling sick, they naturally stay away from the other uh, other vampire bats until they're feeling better. Huh, isn't that weird? Yeah, it's super weird, but it kind of makes sense. So so listen to this experiment. So the, the researchers ended up capturing 31 wild uh, female adult vampire bats from inside a hollow tree in Belize. Right? So I guess okay. they got a lot of vampire bats down in Belize. 
So yeah. that's, that's a pretty cool adventure, too. I'm sure going out and capturing 31 of these giant vampire bats <laughs> in the hollow <laughs> of a tree. That That's the subject for another podcast. <laughs> and then they gave them. Now, now, please note, according to the researchers, no vampire bats were harmed in this experiment. <laughs> but they they injected them with an immune challenging substance that simulated sickness. So they weren't really sick. It just temporarily simulated a sickness. And the other half of the vampire bats were, they received an injection of a placebo, right? Okay. And then they put sensors to all of the bats so that they could track their movements. And when they released the bats, the sick bats or the bats that were uh, injected with this immune challenging substance didn't go back to the tree. They went separately and stayed around the area of the tree. And all of the the bats that got the placebo went back to the tree. That's interesting. So uh, even though placebo was given, it was somehow known by the bats what was given that was real. Yeah, because they could tell, like it does simulate sickness or makes them right. feel sick. And they can right. tell, hey, I'm not feeling well, so I better not go back to the main house. Yeah, that's a, a remarkable uh, uh, study in nature. You well, know, I think that- it's pretty cool. You know, and, and Bill, you know, like cue the James Bond music now. Like I've traveled a lot in Asia, spent a fair amount of time in Japan. And when I was in Japan the first time, I didn't really understand the mask thing. You know, like you'll see... If pictures in Japan, some of the people, you know, getting onto the subway or walking down the street are wearing masks, you know, either like fashionable cloth masks or the old fashioned surgical masks. And I was like, what? what are they like afraid of germs? And then when I learned as I got to know some of the Japanese people, it's more of a tradition like the vampire bats, where if you're feeling sick or you are sick, you put on a mask so that you don't get everyone else sick. And That's uh, crazy, Kev, because I was always under the impression it was a pollution-related issue. Well, sometimes it's that, especially in China, where the yeah. pollution is nuts. But in Japan, the pollution is not that bad, in my experience. Yeah. In China, like, you know, you go to Shanghai or whatever, man, I put an oxygen tank on my back, you know. Yeah. The first no, it's, time it's, I was in Shanghai, they said, you know, the local folks said, oh, no, that's just fog. And I was like, how come my eyes feel like they're going to fall out of my head? <laughs> yeah. Fog. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> so, yeah, some of it's pollution, but a lot of it is just, uh, you know, to prevent others from getting sick. And, of course, I bring it up. You don't have to connect the dots on this story where it's like, hey, we're starting to see another spike of COVID, unfortunately. Nobody wishes this would go away more than me, but, you know, just put your mask on. I, I'm getting tired of wearing a mask, too, but put your mask on. Keep others from getting sick. Yeah, no, it's 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 a good deal, you know. And uh, But getting back to these uh, vampire bats, so uh, in the end, uh, have they really gathered anything out of uh, initiating this little project? Like, what? To what end were they trying to accomplish this? Just an investigation? Well, of- they had heard that um, these vampire bats, just generally vampire bats, do socially distance themselves if they're feeling sick. So I guess right. they had seen that before. And then right. they ran this study. And, and you know, I reported the results like every single bat stayed away and everyone went back. Of course, you know, there's, there's details of how many did. But they definitely, the, the results of the experiment showed that this is definitely, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, something that is real. These vampire bats do socially distance themselves when they're feeling sick, mm-hmm. which is super interesting. interesting, right? Yeah, yeah. So, and you know, it, the folks are going to be listening to this on the day after Halloween when there's a full moon with the vampire bats flying overhead. And if you see one that was off by itself from the rest of the bats, he's probably got a cold or something like that. (laughs) Unbelievable. You know, it just, it always amazes me. You know, uh, people like to think uh, that we've got it all under control. You know, we are the apex of knowledge on this planet. Yeah. But really, 
what we know even today could probably be fit on the head of a pin next to the available knowledge uh, in this universe. You know, the greatest minds on our planets have only scratched the surface, uh, and we look at them, and rightfully so, as being like genius, you know? Oh, yeah. Well, especially when we're talking about, you know, things that occur in less explored settings, whether it be the forests of Canada, like, um, uh, you know, your your, uh, winner. uh, Jonathan. Jonathan, sorry, thank you, was writing in about, uh, or if it's on the bottom of the ocean floor where they're yeah. discovering new creatures all the time. Yeah. We don't, and what, we don't what, know much. Right. What we think is not necessarily so a good amount of the time. Right. You know, and occasionally you get a genius like uh, Tesla coming along who postulates uh, these theories and uh, experiment experiments with them and proves them to be true. Uh, but and we're amazed by it. Like, where the heck did this guy come up with this stuff oh, from? Yeah. But it just shows you. You know, Kev, I'm writing this new book, and I'm not going to announce it now. Has nothing to do with Bigfoot. Has nothing to do with exorcism. Uh, but in the book, I mention that when Adam uh, and Eve were in the garden, if you believe that, and I do. Uh, he was originally created as pure genius, such as uh, man uh, has never known since him, since the fall. And uh, one of the things I give as evidence of that is that, uh, you know, in the Genesis, uh, he is asked to name all of the animals, Now, if you think about that, with no education, no schooling, no ABCs, no nothing, he was asked to name the animals. So we know he knew how to do that, and there's probably a lot more that we were gifted to know initially before everything went haywire. And to me, it's amazing when we get an individual like a Tesla or Michelangelo, or you could pick whoever you want, uh, who comes out and opens our eyes briefly to some of the amazing details of the universe that most people will never think about or or are even capable of thinking about. Right. Uh, And these vampires, the vampire bats, is just another one of those little things. Like, what an amazing (laughs) thing that the bat, was given the ability to segregate when sick. Oh, no doubt about it. That's why I thought it was super cool. All right, it Bill, is cool. but now we're going to look for werewolves. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing like a werewolf. Oh, yeah. And this article, uh, I'm going to start out with an article um, from the Express in uh in the UK, probably around London, I think the Express is published, that appeared on Sunday, May 15th, 2016, so about four years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, the headline is, Residents Trembling in Terror After Seeing Eight-Foot Werewolf in British City. What, What year was this, Kev? 2016. Yeah, this is like very recent. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm going to um, go through some excerpts from the story. So this happened in uh, the center of a city called Hull, like the hull of a ship. And okay. uh, for our listeners in the UK, I even checked out the pronunciation on Google, and it is Hull. <laughs> well, if you didn't get it right, Duel would I certainly know. check I, in I'm with worried us. worried about Duel showing up here. <laughs> But so so seven, Bill, seven separate eyewitnesses claim to have spotted the eight foot tall creature lurking in an abandoned industrial area outside the city center of Hull. And Hull, uh, I think I mentioned it's on the eastern seaboard of Great Britain. And the residents and folklore experts believe the mythical beasts said to turn from human to wolf at the new at the new moon is a legendary creature called Old Stinker, 
which, uh, <laughs> yeah, an old stinker is actually also known as the Flixton werewolf. Wow. Yeah. I wonder if he smells. Well, they say in the legends that his breath is extremely foul. Uh-huh. Yeah, and he he prowled the Yorkshire wolf. Woods, which is an area that's pretty close by to the city of Hull, relatively huh. close by. And by the way, that creature, Old Stinker or the Flixton Werewolf, goes all the way back to the 10th century, Bill. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Super creepy. You know, and of course, you know why I was going by the stink thing, because, you know, the... Of course, yeah. The, the Bigfoot... Uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The um, uh, the fact that the Bigfoot is always or many times is uh, smell is relevant to sightings, you know, exactly. a stinkiness. Of- exactly. No doubt about it. So, you know, mm-hmm. this uh, this uh, creature was was first reported in this this year in 2016 along this area called the Bromston Drain which is an old water channel. So think of it like a canal kind of running down on on the edge of the city there. But it was Uh built in 1798. But it looks, I looked at it on Google today, and it looks like it still has, you know, it still has water running through it. So, you know, maybe 50 feet across with high walls on the side, you know, and kind of a straight water channel that runs along the side of the city. Okay. Yeah. And they people saw that um, uh, saw it there before Christmas, and then again leading up into May. Lots of different people saw it, and one woman saw, said that she saw it turn from a man to a beast as she stood on the bridge above, looking down at it. She said it stood upright one moment, the next it was down on all fours, running like a dog. And it ran down the embankment toward the water on all fours, and it vaulted and jumped 30 feet over to the other side and vanished up the embankment. Now, you know, this sounds a lot like a shapeshifter. Ah, uh, yes, sir. Uh, now, how many people... Uh, this was like in in uh, the news or written up in some of the local papers. Yeah, this was written up in the Express. You know, a okay. local paper over there, and they talk about seven uh, folks that uh, that saw it. And uh, this woman was terrified, and they say in the article that the locals plan on a werewolf hunt with cameras and recording equipment. Again, we're in the UK, Bill, so they're not hunting with uh, Mac tens. <laughs> They're hunting with cameras and recording equipment, which is very nice. Yeah. And, um, and God help you if it attacks you. <laughs> They're waiting for the next full moon. And local counselor Steve Wilson had offered to keep up an incident log. He said, I'm happy to keep a diary of sightings by people around here and report them to the Hull Council. Uh huh. Yeah. 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 I mean, uh, what do you make of this? I mean, as you're checking this out, uh, legit or not? It seems legit. I mean, you know, I mean, people could be making things up. I don't think anyone like dressed up like a werewolf because I don't know anybody that could jump 30 feet across the river and scamper away on all fours. Right. Or or change from human to. Yeah. In front of your eyes. Yeah. Um, you know, so it that sounds, you know, legit in its own way. And then what's really interesting is this area um, is an area that's been known for werewolves, again, going all the way back to the 10th century. You know, Kev, it, it's so easy. I'm sitting here listening to your report and I'm. Um, trying to wear two hats. I don't even know why I'm trying to do that, but it's so easy, whether we're talking about a werewolf, a Bigfoot, a Mothman, Spring Heels Jack, whatever it may be, it's so easy to just make the immediate jump uh, to not true. Yeah. I mean, isn't it? Oh. it? It just like invades your mind immediately. Well, and, you know, my my logical mind is I, I always look for the simpler explanation. Again, you know, the the Occam's razor approach versus the right. more complex 
explanation. And certainly, you know, to think that there's these uh, lycanthrope creatures that are, are been venture have been getting around since the uh, uh, 10th century <laughs> to today, running mm-hmm. around this area of Scarborough and Hull. Uh, uh, England, it's you know that's that's a pretty complex explanation, but you know it's well unless they're coming in and out of our reality. Well, that that's true. So it's interesting. One of these folks that um, this guy Mike Covell, who is an expert in the supernatural over there in that area, they the a lot of the locals sought the help of him and his opinion, and he said in this article, I was skeptical at first. But then more and more people contacted me, independent of one another, and they all said that they saw the same exact thing. So he said, you know, you don't know what to do. And that's why they're calling him, because he said it's kind of hard to pop down to the uh, local police station and say you just saw a werewolf. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You do be looked at as a fool. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Even even if you were good hearted and, and good spirited about it, and you just wanted to make a report, uh, how many people would uh, go through the checklist and say, "Yeah, I don't think so. Maybe I'll go food shopping." Yeah, yeah. So you now know, we're going to go way. back in time. I'm going to tell you a little bit about these old sightings, and uh, they're pretty cool. So Flixton and the Flixton Werewolf. Flixton's a little village, small village about five miles south of the city of Scarborough on the North Yorkshire coast. So also, you know, relatively close to Hull, same area of the country. Okay. And uh, this little town, it's in a valley, um, and it's on the south edge of what's called the North York Moors. Mm. So kind of like a, a desolate landscape that's swampy and open. And then they say that long ago... It was actually a pretty dense forest as well. Uh, where the moors are exactly, currently? Exactly. So I never got into oh, whenever, what happened to the trees. but Yeah, well, whenever I hear about the moors, I think of the Hound of the Baskervilles of the from Baskervilles. Uh, Sherlock Holmes. And then I think of one of my favorite movies of all time, uh, The American Werewolf in London, where they, they go into this bar, the two guys, one of them becomes a werewolf, and uh, the bar's called the Slaughtered Lamb. Yeah. <laughs> it might have been right there in Flixton, for all I know. And um, <laughs> this little village pub, and they, the, the villagers kick them out, and it's a full moon. And they say, stay off the moors. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But these North Thanks. York moors are 550 square miles of desolation. It's a big, big area. Big area. So you can see... Uh, See, um, you know, that it's definitely possible for some creature to be out there. So get this. So back in the year 940, 940, apparently the situation was so bad around Flixton where people were getting attacked and killed uh, while they were moving along there like travelers that they built a special hostel in Flixton specifically for the protection of travelers. Hmm. So that's something, right? Uh, did it say uh, how they were being killed? Uh, ripped apart. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that's so. That's by some some type of wild. Oh yeah. Whatever. Something fierce. So yeah. you know, and and then so there were a lot of attacks there in the nine hundreds, and then it went away for a couple of hundred years. But in around eleven fifty. The year 1150, the reports began again, and some assumed it was the same, like, very old creature. And there was Mm. a story where this creature attacked and devoured a local shepherd and a young girl, as well as farm animals. Yeah. Attacked and devoured. Exactly. I mean, you've got to be a fairly substantial creature, whatever you are. To devour even a child. Yeah. I mean, that's a lot of uh, meat, pardon the pun. Yep. So get this, get this. There's another twist, and this gets to your comment earlier. There's another twist to the legend where it was believed that the werewolf was connected to a local magician 
who either used the creature for his own ends or was actually a shapeshifter himself who took on a wolf form. Wow. Isn't that wild? So, Yeah, so there we go to the shapeshifter again. Yep. Yeah. You know, this creature, whether it's one or numerous uh, uh, entities, could have actually been welcomed into this realm by somebody participating in the demonic at some point in time. Right. And that could be the, uh, you know, this magician, right? Like, yeah, that's probably what you would call somebody like that back in that day. If, if they weren't yeah. a witch or a warlock. Right. 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 Well, look, all it takes is one. Yep. Exactly. You know, it's like starting a fire. Yep. One guy, one match, throwing it in the leaves. Yep. And ba-boom. And, you know. Yeah, and then there's another story where around the year 1800, a carriage traveling from the city of York was attacked just outside of Flixton by a huge wolf-like creature who first attacked the driver and then the occupants of the carriage. One of the occupants shot the creature, but the creature appeared to be unha- unharmed and ran away. Huh. Now, where did this account come from? S- some old one-sheet newspaper there's or something a, there's like a that? Just, there's a whole bunch of them on the Internet, you know. Yeah. That they're, I mean, they're so old. A lot of these are before newspapers, you know, 900. Right. S- stories handed and down. Stories handed down. Legends, you know. Right. Yeah. Well, I look, if you're in a coach with a number of people and a driver and uh, you're going click, clock, click, clock, click, clock, and something attacks you. Yeah. I mean, uh, that would certainly be something that would be repeated once you reached the civilized world again with your coach. What a exactly. crazy story that is. Exactly. And, um, you know, so it's uh, it's pretty interesting, this Flixton werewolf. Yeah. Well, listen, and once again, let's shout out to our uh, listeners. We have a lot of listeners over in uh, Britain and uh, Europe. If you guys know anything more about this Flixton werewolf or any other werewolf-type entity, certainly reach out to us at BigfootTerrorInTheWoods.com. Hit the contact button and let us know what you know. And uh, we'll investigate it. Am I right, Kevin? Absolutely. And and meanwhile, stay off the moors. Yeah. (laughs) And if you hang out in the slaughtered lamb playing darts, we'd love to hear from you, too. Yeah, I'd like to know if there really is a place called the Slaughtered Land. After COVID, I'm going over there looking for it, buddy. I think the place was called Eat the Ham, (laughs) and somebody renamed it the Slaughtered Lamb. (laughs) I want to walk along the moors on a full moon. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I heard areas of the moors, though, are like quicksand. Yes, that's true. So uh, I'll stay away from those quicksand areas. (laughs) Oh, man. You know, but... You said that it was, at some point, it was forested? That's what they say, you know, many, many years ago. Yeah. I mean, maybe something happened there where it, it started to accumulate more water and flooded out the trees' who roots you know, and whatnot. Could, who, you know. knows? who knows? Who knows? Oh, speaking of the trees' roots being flooded out, uh, Kev, you remember we did those couple of pieces uh on the uh, Bigfoot or the Swamp Ape when they would buy those giant cypress trees? Yeah, absolutely, down in Florida. Yeah, now somebody told me something very interesting about a week ago, that at the base of the cypress trees, there are tubes, and they actually call them snorkels, Mm. that come out from the root system and grow up to the air. Because, you know, a lot of these cypress are in water. Oh, absolutely, yeah. The snorkels are tubes that bring air to the root system. Oh, isn't that interesting? Uh, Here we are talking about vampires segregating uh, when they're sick. And this tree was by design able to grow and live in water where other trees just die out. Yeah. And it thrives in there by this snorkel system. It's got tons of water, tons of nutrients. And it's getting the oxygen to the roots. Super cool. Amazing, huh? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, the person I was talking to told me that some of these cypress trees 
can have diameters of like 10 oh, yeah. feet. No doubt about it. They're huge. So it made me think when we were looking at those videos of those creatures walking by these trees, who knows? We had no data on how big the trees were. But if that one that was hunched over snapping off the wood that stood up before that guy took off, yep. uh, what if that tree was like, you know, eight feet wide? Well, the thing just looked huge. Yeah. Regardless of scale, like it just had a, you know, gave you a feeling of its width and breadth, right? Yeah, just an enormous, thick, burly beast. beast. Yeah. Crazy, man. All right, what do you got for us, Bill? Well, I got a really interesting uh, sighting here out of Oregon, mm. uh, brought to my attention by a fellow named Lester West, uh, a resident of the state of Oregon. This is what Lester saw while he was hiking in the Blue Mountains area of uh, the state of Oregon. Which is a hotbed, right? Like the Blue Mountains there, it's a lot of accounts. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff in Oregon in, in general. Yeah. I think I think that show, uh, what what was it again, Kev? Hunting for Bigfoot or Expedition Bigfoot? Okay. That was set in Oregon. Okay. So this was in the summer of 1982, with the state <laughs> having been through somewhat what of a drought in which I was hiking in an area near the Blue Mountains Range, seeking out a productive area for an upcoming hunt for Rocky Mountain elk. With the rainfall having been sparse at best, many of the most productive spots in past years had been all, had all but dried up, leaving me with the unenvious task of locating something that was still producing water. Find the water and you'll find the animals. It's just that simple, particularly when there's little or nothing available. This fact was made also clear to me while on safari in Africa in 1978. I had flown in on the tail end of the dry season when the guides had brought me in near one of the remaining watering holes Every animal that you could imagine was coming there to water, regardless of the dangers that were associated with being there. One way or another, they may die, but instinctively, it wasn't going to be of thirst. And so they came. So now he goes back four years later, 82. And he says, at the time of this sighting, I had some area knowledge, but by but was by no means a walking atlas of everything that was available in the region. I had been here on several past hunts, having put in about 20 or 30 miles of hiking, which was a mere drop in the bucket, so to speak, when one is talking about millions of acres. On my first day of reconnaissance, things really looked bleak, having seen a total of two squirrels and a sickly raccoon walking around during the daytime. And that was it. And so on day two, I moved northward with my truck and re-entered the woods in hopes of locating some better terrain and water. At about 1 p.m., I came upon a trickle of water running downhill, which appeared like that which would come out of a garden hose when draining a pool down the street. It wasn't much, but it was water, and so I began to follow it uphill in the hope of finding the source. This trickle was widening to the point where what I was tracing was about a foot wide and maybe an inch deep, and so I continued, when finally I came upon the water's origin. It was what I will call an artesian well, a bubbly spring of clear, clean water coming up from the earth which was forming a shallow pool and then overrunning its borders going downhill. This shallow pool was about three feet wide and eight feet long, and all around this semi-wet area which surrounded it were dozens upon dozens of fresh prints, including those of a Bigfoot. For the sake of those who don't believe, I knew immediately what I was looking at, having never seen one before. There were many animal tracks present, which I was familiar with. And then there were the gigantic human-like footprints of the Bigfoot, 
which was some 18 to 20 inches long and about 9 inches wide at the toes. I hadn't even had time to think in real terms about what all this meant when I heard a snap and a popping sound, and as my head lifted to face the direction of the sound, an enormous Bigfoot came out of the trees, walking from my right to my left, about 60 feet away from me. It was massive in every sense of the word, and the body was so huge that the head almost looked like it had been placed on the wrong creature by its creator. Based on what I could see, as it walked in the shadows of the forest canopy, it was covered entirely with a thick coat of somewhat auburn-colored fur, which was tipped here and there with white, similar to when a woman gets her hair frosted. If it was, in fact, hair, as many have said, then it was a very thick amount, like that of a grizzly. Don't get me wrong, this was in no case... This was no case of misidentification. It was a tall, heavily muscled, bipedal beast with huge, thick arms swinging slowly in cadence with its steps as it walked. This very small head was leaning forward on an angle, backed by its enormous upper back in a way that looked like it may be quite uncomfortable in human terms, but this was no human. I saw it take about six steps, and on step number three, it turned rather matter-of-factly, looked directly at me, then it turned right back and walked away. My belief after the sighting was that it had been at the watering hole and heard me coming, stepped into the tree cover until it saw just what was arriving, And without any apparent fear whatsoever, it simply made a decision to move on, perhaps until I had left, revealing itself completely to me as it did so. I've heard many people say since that day how quickly these creatures are capable of moving, which may in fact be quite true given the right situation. However, based on what I saw, this particular creature was moving in a way which reminded me of an elephant. It was very slow and lethargic, even after it had looked directly at me. Its eyes and face were dark black, so much so that the eyes were really indistinguishable from the skin on its face. Looking back on this whole affair, one of the strangest things was that I wasn't afraid. Rather, I was in somewhat of a state of shock, being blown away by what was before my eyes. I know that many have stated these beasts appear like muscle men, but I beg to differ. Of course, there may be, there may well be different varieties, as well as them changing with age, but this thing was thick from head to toe. It looked like three 50-gallon drums welded together end-to-end, walking through the trees. I also understand fully the ridicule which many must endure when they open their mouths to speak of these things, having actually had a couple of friendships go south before because of it. Nobody wants to be ridiculed or become a laughingstock when sharing their own personal experience, but that's exactly what happened to me after the fact. having shared this sighting with literally hundreds of people through the passing years. My belief now is that these creatures stand alone with no competition in the woods, and I am certain that had it wanted to, it could have had to jump on me, and that would have been the end of it all. What do you think of that, Kev? That's pretty spectacular. The old watering hole. (coughs) Makes yeah, sense. and you know, find the water, find the creatures. I mean, that's that's as old school as it gets, you no, know. Per- makes perfect sense. I mean, I was surprised that he saw the creature. Like, I thought it was going to be uh, an evidentiary uh, review, you know, that he sees the footprints, which are unbelievable, right? Like, what did he say, 18 to 20 inches long and 9 inches wide? 
Yeah, at the toes. Yeah, like geez. it's a big. Okay, that's a it's a big foot. It's a big foot. <laughs> yeah. And look, you're out in the middle of the nowhere. He's following a trickle that's a little artesian well bubbling over. Uh, I mean, we've seen them, right? We had that. There was a couple over here on Long Island artesian wells, you know. Oh yeah, no, and it's like, you know, with COVID, I haven't been out as much in the forest as I normally am hiking around. And this past weekend, uh, I don't know if I told you, Bill, but uh, the wife and I went up to outside of Boone, North Carolina, for a long weekend for our anniversary up in the forest there. And uh, we were hiking along on Grandfather Mountain, you know, which is a a high point in North Carolina. And it's a very touristy place, so don't get me wrong. It's not like the uh, Blue Mountains of Oregon. Um, But it was interesting there. They have these, like, large areas of rhododendron bushes that are giant, though, on this mountain. And, you know, and they're tall, like six or eight feet tall, but almost like a carpet from the distance. And there could be any kind of a creature walking along in those rhododendron, and you couldn't even see them from the hillside next to it because they'd be under the canopy Yeah, this, these rhododendron. This. So it's like, you know, and this is, and Grandfather Mountain is relatively rural for North Carolina, but nothing like the the these mountains in Oregon or, you know, the sightings we talk about in British Columbia, for example. Yeah, and if you just think about any woods you go into, even a fairly open woods, after a couple of hundred feet with the trees staggered left and right and this and that, it becomes virtually a wall of screen at a certain distance that you can't see anything beyond that No doubt about it. Absolutely. Uh, It's like fence pickets filling in as the distance increases. And you reach a certain point where it's really a wall of lumber, and you're not seeing anything anymore. Yep. Very cool. So uh, really interesting. And for folks that don't know what an artesian well is, it's basically like a natural little bubbling spring. And at times in the day, the water can stop, and other times it's bubbling out. Uh, it's like under some type of pressure. It's got to be driven by pressure from the Earth's crust. Uh, or something that uh, is driving it up, uh, and then it recedes, and then it's driven up, and it recedes. So uh, this would be a water source that would kind of come and go uh, during the day, and if someone was pooling around there, it would certainly be known by the animals and the birds and everything else. Hmm. I thought it was the name of a bar that was down the street from you in Long Island. (laughs) Yeah, the Artesian Well. (laughs) But, you know, uh, here we have a guy, again, that uses the terminology of the 50-gallon drum. I know. Yeah, I forgot to mention that, too. Yeah, three 50-gallon drums, like, tied together. And, yeah. End to end. End to end, yeah. And we so had the account a couple of weeks ago, right, where it was, like, two of them tied together side by side, like the chest of it, which that gives you a feel right. for the scale. Right. And then we had the other guys, the, uh, the uh, pheasant hunters— when that creature busted out of the uh, briar patch and he fired two rounds out of his over-under at it and he said the chest looked like a barrel. Yes, yes. Or, or a couple of drums yep. together. So it's, people relate what they will relate, right? A drum, a barn door. Uh, they they just try to think in a moment of something to relate the size to. No doubt you know? about it. It's kind of weird, you know. So in that in that regard, we're very much alike, you know. Super cool. Yeah, yeah, really interesting. You know, and it reminded me, Kev, remember that video clip you did many, many months ago? Uh, that older gentleman that was following the tracks through the woods talking while he was filming? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's a famous, uh, famous sighting. Yeah, uh, I'm trying to think of his think name. Of and then all either. of a sudden he said, oh, there it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There it is. And it was walking through the woods ahead of him and kind of looked at him. Yep. Uh, and that was a big burly beast, oh, too. Oh, no doubt about it. All, so, all the footage uh, is like serious scale, you know. Yeah, well, it's, 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 it's awesome. Big, well, big. we got some great letters this week, Bill. And thank you, everybody, for writing in. Uh, this week, we got some cool ones. So, this first one is from Chris, and uh, the subject is red eyes. So, it's kind of yeah. like, Chris, you had me at red eyes. Uh (laughs) And this is cool. He says, just a theory on why we see red eyes from this creature. 
Some animals have the ability to see in the infrared spectrum. He may also have the ability to illuminate his surroundings with infrared energy projected from his eyes. Older night vision used this technique, and one of the downsides is seeing a slight red glow from the infrared emitter. Technology has overcome this flaw by using a different wavelength of infrared light that's not visible. Maybe evolution has given Bigfoot the ability not to not only to see in this spectrum, but also illuminate his surroundings, giving him a very big predatory edge. Hmm. Bigfoot has just developed bioluminescence in the infrared range, can project it onto his surroundings, thereby giving him far better night vision than any known creature on the planet. This may also account for the odd all-black eyes as well. Really enjoy all you all what you guys do. Have all your Bigfoot books, one through six, Chris. Wow, that's interesting. Isn't that an interesting letter? Yeah, it is interesting. And, of course, I have no knowledge about what he's talking about, <laughs> it, so I can't really comment on it. Uh, it sounds you know, sounds good, though. You know, like, what the heck? Why not? Yeah. And, of course, if you had this glowing red in the old technology, that wouldn't be to your advantage if your enemy could see it. Right. That's why they while went you to were trying to sculpt them. But, you know, they could still only see it when they were close, whereas you'd be able to see it, see the enemy from far away, you know, with the night vision. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, uh, I mean, look, it's 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 a theory. Uh, who knows? I've always wondered about the red eyes and will continue to wonder. Sure. But uh, again, Kev, it's not just Bigfoot that has red eyes. You know, it's demons oh, yeah. and a lot of other weird Absolutely. stuff. Absolutely. Absolutely. So the red eye thing is not relegated to just some Bigfoot sightings. It's across the board with a lot of weird, spooky kind of stuff, which again leads me to believe in my opinion, that a lot of these encounters are not with a flesh and blood creature. No, so, yeah, no yeah. doubt about it. All right. Our next yeah. letter comes in from Matthew. And get this. Matthew says, hey, Kevin. <laughs> he said That's that? That's how he opened up his note. Hey, Kevin. Yeah, there, must be so- there must be something wrong with I him. know. And uh, he put in a nice letter here. He says, as I was listening to you talk about the Celtic ritual Samhain, I had a flashback to my visit to the Phoenix Museum of Art almost two years ago. There was a large Aztec exhibit, and the main god displayed was the god of fire. He has the name here, but I'm not even going to attempt it. Okay. Also believed to, to be the creator of all life. The following is the description that was on the placard of a stone object on the display. I wish I was able to send a picture of it to you. And it says, multiple sculptures discovered around the Sun Pyramid concern fire drilling and the new fire celebrations. Several show a fire drill with a characteristic twisted cord used to power the pump drill and some portray flames too. The small cylindrical sculpture uh, depicts appears to depict a bundle of reeds for burning in the new fire ceremony. The later Aztecs called such bundles, oh boy, these names, Ziumolpili or something like that, or year uh-huh. bundles. Uh-huh. Before the Aztec new fire ceremony, celebrated every 52 years, all fires in the empire were extinguished. And a new flame was drilled and then spread throughout their empire as part of the renewal rites for the sun and cosmos. Pretty cool, huh? So from from that one fire, all the fires in the empire were restarted. And he writes, I was really shocked at the similarities. I actually went back to make sure you weren't talking about the Aztecs. You know, it's, uh, this fire drilling, I, I'm I'm a little, 
uh, set back by that? Are they, you know, were the, they like the drilling I into some magma? To, the, the nearest I can come to, Bill, is maybe that's how they started a fire. You know how like you're you're spinning the stick on the base, almost right, like a drill. St- the stick, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That, that's where okay. I got to in that. Yeah, fire drilling. Yeah, you know. I never heard that expression before, though. But that's my guess. Uh, me neither. Yeah. I mean, what else could it be other than if you were drilling a hole into like a magma pool and then contacting the magma with uh, some reeds or something? Exactly. But that would be like really dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. my God. Well, that's, that's so weird stuff, man. I mean, you know, uh, it's remarkable the audience participation, what these people are coming up with. Yeah, you know? super cool. Super cool. Very cool. All right, Bill. Well, that's that's the letters we'll go through this week. Keep the thoughts coming, folks. We love hearing from you. And by the way, keep the five-star reviews coming. And thank you, all of you that are giving us those five-star reviews. And a lot of you are giving us those fantastic five-star written reviews, too. And it's really important to leave us those five-star reviews because it brings more listeners to the podcast. And as we get more listeners, Bill and I can continue to improve the quality of the podcast. And Lord knows there's still room for improvement. (laughs) (laughs) but thank you very much excellent and folks remember uh you're purchasing one of my books helps me out a great deal so uh please go out there buy a book and uh in reference to what the one listener just said he had volumes one through six there's actually eight uh so go out there purchase a couple of books and you'll be helping me out a great deal and If you find yourself walking along the moors, having had a pop or two at the slaughtered lamb, remember, always carry more gun than you think you're going to need. Sleep tight.